VORs were first introduced in the 1940s as the primary means of navigation for commercial and general aviation. This technology empowered the development of artificial highways in the sky, and by the year 2000, there were over 1,000 VORs operating in the United States. After its inception, VORs were also given an additional purpose, to assist pilots with getting into airports via instrument approach procedures. VOR approaches aren't as widely used today as they used to be, as ILS's or GPS approaches seem to be the go-to options. VOR approaches utilize a VOR nav aid facility on the ground to provide lateral guidance for the approach. Sometimes VORs are augmented with DME and or TACAN to provide distance information relative to the VOR. If the aircraft is also equipped with DME, the pilot can use DME to aid their situational awareness, even if the approach does not require it. No matter what sort of equipment is utilized with a specific VOR approach, all VOR approaches are considered non-precision approaches. This also means that no vertical guidance is provided. VOR approaches can provide MDAs as low as 250 feet AGL, although the MDA will often be much higher, as this is the least precise instrument approach procedure commonly used today. VOR approaches can be split into two categories, terminal and non-terminal approaches. Terminal approaches are those where the VOR is located on the field. This means that the VOR serves as both the initial approach fix and the missed approach point. Non-terminal approaches are those where the VOR is somewhere off the field. In these cases, the VOR instead serves as the initial approach fix and the final approach fix. The missed approach point would then be determined by a distance or time from the VOR. Remember, VOR approaches are designed around an existing nav aid on the ground, and there are lots of combinations of initial approach fixes, final approach fixes, and missed approach point locations. Every VOR approach is different, so be sure to familiarize yourself with the approach before accepting the approach clearance. VOR approaches generally consist of three overall steps, an outbound leg where you're tracking a radial away from the VOR, a procedure turn, and then an inbound leg where you're tracking a radial towards the VOR. When not receiving vectors to final, the first steps are to proceed direct to the initial approach fix and then, once cleared for the approach, track the specified radial outbound. The objective of this outbound leg is to travel a logical distance away from the initial approach fix to set up for the final approach inbound. Think of this like a traffic pattern where you want to have a long enough downwind leg to ensure that your turn to final provides enough distance to have a stabilized descent. If your outbound is too short, an excessive descent rate would be required in order to lose enough altitude. Too long, and you'd have to level off at some point until you're closer to the runway. The distance needed will vary depending on the type of VOR approach being flown. For terminal approaches, you should fly a farther distance away from the VOR since the VOR is on the field. Plan on setting yourself up so that after the procedure turn, the aircraft is at least five or six nautical miles away from the runway threshold. That should allow for a stabilized descent on the final approach segment. On non-terminal approaches, the VOR is located some distance off the field, so you only need to fly outbound a couple miles, at least enough to provide space to complete the procedure turn before passing over the VOR a second time inbound. In cases where DME is unavailable, you need to calculate a time duration to fly outbound. This time outbound should be calculated based on your ground speed so that it'll result in the desired distance. Start a timer when passing over the VOR outbound, and then start the procedure turn once your timer has reached the calculated time. The procedure turn is depicted on the plan view of VOR approach, indicated by a 45 degree offset from the radial outbound, and an arrowhead in the initial direction of the turn. Approach plates depict this 45-180 procedure turn type, so that's what we'll be using in our example. But you can fly any type of procedure turn as listed in the instrument procedures handbook. Upon reaching your chosen time or distance outbound from the VOR, fly the outbound heading in the direction of the barbed arrow for one minute. Then reverse course to the reciprocal heading and intercept the final approach course inbound. Remember the time could change based on wind conditions. Keep tracking inbound until commencing the final descent at the final approach fix. This fix will either be depicted on the approach plate with a Maltese cross, or when it's not depicted, you'll need to choose it on your own. A good mnemonic device to use for determining when you can descend on the approach is 1010 cleared. This means that within 10 nautical miles of the initial approach fix, or whatever the maximum allowed distance is for that approach, 
When within 10 degrees of the final approach course, meaning the CDI is no longer at full scale deflection, and when cleared for the approach by ATC. If you have all three of these criteria met, you can descend. However, it's wise to check your DME first. Generally, you want to wait until you're five or six nautical miles from the runway before beginning the final descent. Starting the descent any earlier could lead to the aircraft arriving at the MDA miles before the runway. VOR final approach courses rarely align the aircraft directly with the runway centerline. VORs are large structures and therefore cannot be located too close to the runway, as they'll become a collision hazard. If the VOR is off the field, it's even more likely that it's not aligned with the runway. The final approach course of VOR approaches is typically designed to align the aircraft with the landing runway centerline about 3,000 feet from the runway, with an intersection angle no greater than 30 degrees. Now that we've discussed VOR approaches in general, let's look at a couple examples. We'll start with the VOR2 in Athens, Georgia. First things first, we need to tune and identify the Athens VOR. The frequency 109.6 will need to be tuned into your active nav frequency box. Verify the correct frequency by cross-checking it with the identifier displayed in the frequency box of the approach plate, listed as AHN. This approach is considered a terminal approach because the primary nav aid is located on the field. As is typical of most VOR approaches, there is only one location for the initial approach fix, the Athens VOR itself. If ATC intends for you to perform the full approach, you should be instructed to proceed direct to the Athens VOR and cleared for the approach. Remember that you must have been cleared for the approach before you can follow the instrument approach procedure as depicted. Upon reaching the VOR, follow the procedure for both lateral and vertical guidance. The procedure begins with a turn to a heading of 194. Also twist the OBS to 194. Once established on the 194 degree radial outbound from Athens VOR, reduce power to 2000 RPM and begin a descent down to at or above 2300 feet MSL, assuming you are at a higher altitude. From there, proceed outbound for approximately five to six nautical miles. Make sure to remain within the airspace restriction, in this case, 10 nautical miles from the Athens VOR as indicated in the profile view. At approximately five to six nautical miles from the Athens VOR, begin the procedure turn to the left by flying a heading of 149 degrees for one minute. Then turn right to a heading of 329 degrees and intercept the final approach course of 014 degrees inbound. Because there is no final approach fix depicted on this plate, you may begin the final descent once you've had the 1010 cleared items met. Again, let's use five to six nautical miles from the VOR as our distance from where to begin the descent. At this final approach fix point, reduce power to 2,000 RPMs, lower the pitch to 3 degree nose down, and add 10 degrees of flaps, confirming you're below 110 knots. And approximately apply two nose down trim rotations to help offset the induced nose up from the addition of flaps. These pitch and power settings should assist in enabling 100 knots on a final approach segment, but adjust as necessary. We'll want to calculate a rate of descent from this final approach fix point in order to maintain a stabilized descent to touchdown. After some quick calculations and the help of our climb descent table, as well as other details listed in the approach chart, it looks like about 450 feet per minute for our descent should work well. Hold this rate of descent all the way down to the MDA. For this approach, the straighted minimums are 1,220 feet MSL and one statute mile visibility. As you're descending towards the MDA, be on the lookout for the runway environment. Unless you end up seeing the runway environment, allowing you to continue a normal visual landing, Plan on leveling off at the MDA. Begin the level off process at approximately 10% of your vertical speed above the MDA. At the level off, increase power to 2,400 RPMs and maintain 100 knots. Maintain 1,220 feet without going below it. Remember, 91.175 restricts operating an aircraft below MDA or DA when the visibility is less than prescribed for each approach. Additionally, the ERAU Flight Operations Manual states that instrument approaches may not be initiated to airports that have weather conditions known to be below applicable approach minimums. Maintain 1,220 feet until either a visual reference of the landing runway is observed or the missed approach point has been reached. The missed approach point for this approach is the Athens VOR. If you have a runway visual in sight with the required visibility, continue the calculated rate of descent to the touchdown zone. Reduce power and add flaps as necessary to transition to a normal landing. Let's look at a non-terminal approach with the VOR located off the field. 
For this example, we'll use the VOR21 approach into Tacoa, Georgia. Ensure the frequency 113.4 is entered into the active nav box. Verify it with the identifier listed ODF. The initial approach fix is the Foothills VOR, but remember the VOR is not on the field. It's about six nautical miles from the airport. Because of that, we shouldn't need to travel as far out on the radial. Another thing to note about this approach is the minimum section. There are two different straight in minimums depicted. Which one should you use depends on whether or not the aircraft can identify the cache's fix or not. You can show the distance from the VOR on the G1000 by pulling up the bearing point information on the PFD or by loading the approach on the G1000. This means we can identify the fix and therefore utilize the lower minimums listed underneath the row labeled cache's fix minimums. For the runway 21 straight in approach, the minimums are 1,560 feet MSL and one statute mile visibility. Like with the previous example, you'll start by proceeding direct to the VOR, assuming you're completing the full approach. Make sure to receive your approach clearance before beginning the approach. Upon crossing the VOR, begin a turn to a heading of 023 degrees and twist the CDI to 023. Establish yourself on the 023 degree radial outbound and then begin a stabilized descent down to at or above 5000 MSL if you are at a higher altitude. Since the VOR is off the field, we only need to travel outbound enough to complete a procedure turn. At about the 2 or 3 nautical mile mark outbound from the VOR, begin the procedure turn to the right on a heading of 068 degrees for one minute. Then reverse course to a heading of 248 degrees to intercept the 203 course inbound to the VOR. Once established on the inbound course, begin the descent down to 3,200 feet MSL, as specified on the profile view. For this approach, we can use a stabilized rate of descent of about 550 feet per minute after crossing the final approach fix. One thing to note about this approach is that there is a radial change at the final approach fix, so be sure to turn to the left and then track the 179 radial outbound when crossing over the VOR. Failure to change the CDI from 203 to 179 will result in never reaching the proper angle to land on the runway and could lead to a collision with other traffic or even obstacles in the vicinity of the approach area. After crossing the final approach fix and established on the 179 radial, reduce power to 2000 RPMs, pitch the nose to 3 degrees nose down, lower the flaps to 10 degrees confirming you're below 110 knots, and apply approximately two nose down trim rotations to help offset the induced nose up from the addition of flaps. It is important to ensure that while maintaining the stabilized descent on the final approach course that you cross the caches intersection at or above 1,720 feet MSL or at or above 1,840 feet MSL when utilizing the Gainesville altimeter setting. If you've calculated your descent rate properly, you should arrive at caches close to 1,720 feet. But make sure your distance from the Foothills VOR is 3.8 nautical miles or more before descending any further. This step-down fix could have been in place for various reasons, with the most common being to clear obstacles along the path towards the runway. If you do not have a visual of the runway upon reaching the MDA of 1,560 feet MSL, then increase power to 2,400 RPMs and maintain your altitude close to but not below the MDA until either a visual reference is observed or until the missed approach point which is located at 5.9 nautical miles from the VOR. If no visual of the runway is observed by the missed approach point, then execute the missed approach procedure. On the other hand, if you have visibility greater than one statute mile and a visual of the runway environment, then transition into a normal approach and landing. It is important to know that the two previous examples for VOR approaches are the typical ways to execute them, assuming a perfect scenario where ATC advises you to proceed direct to the initial approach fix. As many pilots can attest to, ATC does not always give the pilot a full approach and rather vectors the pilot onto the final approach course. Also, depending on the direction from which you are arriving, you may want to ask for a vector to final. For example, if arriving from the northeast into Tacoa, completing the procedure turn on the VOR21 is a little awkward and unnecessary if ATC is willing to vector you. If being vectored onto the final approach course, ATC must give you a heading to intercept the final approach course, which should not exceed a 30 degree intercept angle. This vector provided by ATC will help you join the final approach course before reaching the final approach fix. If there is no published final approach fix, ATC will vector you onto the final approach course and tell you the distance from the primary nav aid as part of the approach clearance. 
After joining the final approach course from the ATC issued heading, the inbound procedure remains the same as described in the previous VOR approach examples. A VOR approach is one of the more complicated types of approaches to learn and execute because there are so many variations of them. From determining the final approach fix location, distance to travel outbound, and the use of procedure turns, just to name a few. VOR approaches are taught first because the pilot responsiveness required is not as demanding or as strenuous as it is for GPS or ILS approaches. This is especially helpful to new instrument students studying approaches. VOR approaches are not as common in the United States as they used to be, but they are still somewhat used here and can be widely used internationally. For this reason, it is important to learn about how to execute VOR approaches, understand their differences, and review the ones planned for use before beginning your flight. Understanding these core differences and ways to execute the VOR approaches will lead into the next couple of types of approaches you'll learn. For more examples on VOR approaches and how to execute them, review the FAA Instrument Procedures Handbook and the ERAU SOPM on non-precision approaches.